other side too fast. And apparently I'm talking into a mic that isn't on. Okay, I was, I was apologizing for, uh, I hadn't uploaded all of the images. I put it onto a web slideshow so that it could be more easily recorded and streamed. Uh, so my name's Tom, Tom Hall. I'm uh, that Tommy Hall on various internets. You might know me as that Tarsier guy. Um, I give this, title, this talk a rather awkward title, so uh, thanks for coming. Um, it's probably the abstract more than the title that uh, interested you if, if uh, that's the case. I think this talk should have been called something like on being a scribe in ancient Egypt or uh, a big list of things Tom likes or uh, things Tom rants about uh, in the pub with beer. So um, I want to talk about sort of how as a culture we handle big ideas. So at some point the, the big idea was um, agriculture, so growing stuff was like the big idea sort of 15,000 years ago or whatever and what happens is it becomes a way of um, increasing population densities actually uh, health goes down when we start to grow things but um, I think it's, life is somehow less precarious because you can uh, have food st shortages and stuff although people are less healthy and they don't live as long which is kind of uh, reaching forward to our modern day where we live in a world of abundance and we, we destroy ourselves with, with awful food that we create for ourselves. Um, so yeah, and, but also it allows concentration of power that's not previously possible. So I want to just talk about a few uh, uh, creations, discoveries, uh, and then how they're used and how that might be relevant to uh, software development or programming or computation. So. Uh, if you'll bear with me. Um, at one point, again, writing was the great idea. Um, this comes not long after the agricultural revolution, from what we can tell. So it bec writing becomes the big thing. Um, well, not the big thing in the sense of everybody doing it, but the big thing in the sense of it's very important. So the scribes, or uh, I don't know if they would be called scribes in uh, Mesopotamia, actually, but, but this, is, this is cuneiform, so the what's considered to be the first script. It was used using uh, wedge-shaped markers into clay tablets, which were then baked. So that's, it may just be that they were the most durable form, so we have to be a bit wary of thinking people were obsessed with burying people and obsessed with stones uh, when they may actually have had a, quite a rich material culture that just doesn't survive. So um, as always with archaeology, you have to be wary of like the survival bias of the sort of durable objects. So yeah, writing was a big idea. Um, in, I think, uh, the Mayan civilization, it was actually knots. So they would tie knots and send people running through the, through the hills between the uh, towns to try and send messages and stuff. But again, not everybody was doing this, just, just the rulers are using it. But, and, and I think relevant to lots of us, the people who uh, were in that position, who had the special skills, Firstly, it's, it's quite often people who are already rich who can afford to train their children in the, in the thing that is important to Pharaoh or whatever. And uh, as I say, it's an, it becomes an instrument of power. It's how Pharaoh measures his taxes. It's how he decides, um, it's how he <laughs> declares war in large part. Uh, it's how he celebrates his victories. Or if you study ancient Egypt, they always celebrate their victories. And you, have to you can detect their defeats by the victories become closer to home again um, as they get sort of chased out of other areas which is quite nice um, so sorry I don't know why I remember that that's not relevant to my argument um, so yeah writing was the great idea at first it was an elite few that did it they were special and they were treated and it was an instrument of power um, this is a, a Lindisfarne gospel uh, you can see them in Lindisfarne or the British Library have a few good examples. So these are, these are sort of many, many man hours per page. And it was man hours then. I'm, I'm not, I'm not being, being sexist. They were. Um, so many, many man hours into them. Again, rich people can afford them. A special priestly class deals with um, the creation of these artifacts. Uh, and again, the, I don't, I don't know want to say instruments of power because I might upset the religious among you. Uh, I, again, though, I would say access to them was, was, was limited. Um, not necessarily the case with some of these. Some of these would have been uh, devotional objects shared in churches and stuff, but certainly the, 
uh, spare capacity to afford their creation was only for the for the wealthy. Uh, oh, I put a note to myself because I can't I can't necessarily guarantee that the pictures will trigger everything. So I found out quite recently, um, in just in terms of we talk about privilege and stuff like that. Uh, at one point, if you were if you could recite Psalm 51 in Latin, you were tried by an ecclesiastical court, not a, a, a civil court, and they were much more lenient. So when you look now at like the differences of you know crack cocaine sentencing versus powdered cocaine sentencing and the societal uh, connotations there and the color of your skin correlating with how severe your sentences are, how likely you are to be uh, stopped and searched, etc. Actually being able to, well, they said read, but really, if you, were, if, you were, if you were smart enough to remember the sounds, you could do it. And I always read a chap called uh, Gordon Child on this stuff so sort of early uh, early civilization um, from a sort of m moderately left wing uh, perspective he's been called a Marxist ar archaeologist but I don't think that's the case um, but I discovered during the uh, more recent last few days worth of research a chap called Harvey J. Graff now that's just more a note to me and to yourselves that it might be worth taking a peek at him more contemporary uh, Historian of uh, sort of, I guess, I guess, culture, cultural historian. Sorry. Sorry, Is that which <laughs> <laughs> I am not. A, I am not a religious scholar. Oh, by the way, sorry. I had a disclaimer that I nearly added. Um, I think to sort of paraphrase Brendan Eich on JavaScript, uh, anything that's good in this talk is probably not original, and anything that's <laughs> original is probably not good. Um, so, so uh, full disclaimer, yeah. Um, and also, yeah, I'm not a, a religious studies expert. Um, and then the printing press came along, democratized things, but as you probably know, there was a battle around that as well. Who gets to control them? Is it illegal? Who gets... And there, and there are also large, expensive devices, so then it, it kind of... It, it's very likely that you are... A, you know, a, wealth, a wealthy to-do person before you can get one. So people club together, they start using them, then they're made illegal, etc. So again, there's always battles around technology. There's people here um, who I think can talk better about that. Um, coincidentally, while I was preparing this talk, I started reading a book called uh, The Intellectuals and the Masses. So this is a chap called John Carey was invited to give a very prestigious lecture series on, or I think a single lecture, on modernism and basically slaughtered the whole endeavour. Um, I'm not saying I agree entirely with, it, with his premise, which seems to be that as, ma as mass literature arrives, so from, say, 1850 to 1900, you start to get mass literature. By 1920, most people in uh, Western Europe can read. And the intellectuals say, well, what makes us special now? Why, if everybody can do this, we can't allude to uh, books we've read and we can't be the ones that have this, the secret knowledge. So his argument is that essentially literary modernism, this, this sort of uh, what seems to me impenetrable uh, work, which, I, I, I mean, I'm conflicted because I have good friends that, that are really, really into it and really value it. And um, so I don't want to say I'm sort of all in with Carey here, but... I think the book does paint the, the, the actual, and I know it's a bit ad hominem, but the actual characters doing this work are pro-fascist, pro-euthanasia, like, uh, or what, what's the worst, what's worse than euthanasia? Uh, my mind's gone on a blank. The, uh, the one where you just want to kill lots of people, not necessarily people that want it. Gen no, I'm thinking, eugenics they call it, didn't they? Good, good genics, yeah, sorry. Excuse me, my memory's a little off. I'm a little bit unwell. Um, so yeah, his argument is that uh, the, that is the point of it. The point of it is to exclude people. So there's, um, there's another book by a chap called Hoggart called... Um, <laughs> shouldn't try and do things off the cuff. Um, Uses of literacy it is. And he kind of takes the, a different view to this where he thinks that um, the, uh, the, the masses are kind of being dumbed down Whereas this is, the, I guess, a, maybe a, an opposing or opposite view that the intellectuals are sort of retreating somewhere else, um, which I thought was quite interesting. So, and yeah, and it was actually, D.H. Lawrence actually explicitly says, 
that they're trying to create a body of esoteric doctrine defended from the herd. So if the, the point of it is almost to, to, to exclude people. And I worry when uh, I look at the discourse in communities I'm part of, and let's say someone discovers Haskell, they're really, really happy that you know, they found this new purely functional thing, and then you talk to them about you know somebody who does PHP or whatever, and they're like, oh oh no, that's you know that's that's disgusting, and I and I don't know if I don't know if it's are we trying to bring everyone along to the nice place we are where we are, are we trying to say I found something great guys come on pile in let's all go and have a look at this or are we saying I kind of like that I know what a homo you know. Uh, uh, homomorphism is and are we saying that you know oh I like I, li- I like the I like the reserved words and and uh, and I'm not, I'm not arguing that people are well I'm not arguing that all people are necessarily but I think there's a danger of it there's a danger of of finding something new and sneering at the at the masses that are left over oh still doing Java oh um, etc so just wanted us to be aware of that um one thing, so this is a this is a bit this is a bit rambly, um, so excuse me. Um, I'm not going to change it. I'm just going to apologise in the middle. Um, <laughs> what do you say? Hat. <laughs> Hat. Was that? Oh, sorry. I thought someone said. <laughs> excuse me. I thought someone said hat. Um, and, I was, and I was trying to figure out why that looked like a hat. Um, so, uh, yeah, so mathematics is another area of interest in mine. My, my degree was in mathematics. Um, so this is a Babylonian uh, clay tablet again. Um, again, using the same wedge-shaped uh, things to make the indentations. It was much easier to be a polymath back then, so the people that were the writers were also the... Uh, mathematicians were also in, you know, in large part the philosophers that becomes less true over time as we kind of um, branch out and find our little niche in order to take, take knowledge forward and get our PhDs etc um, so this is actually I think I stole it from Wikipedia and it's somehow depicting uh, the square root of 2 which they did know about which is quite interesting um, so now I'm going to talk briefly about mathematics mathematics has a similar kind of path where um, it starts off as a thing just for the elites. Then uh, it's an instrument of power again, like how much taxes do you go, how much interest do I apply to that loan, um, you know, the wongas of the sort of uh, Bronze Age or whatever. Um, and then now everybody sort of kind of does it. Now this isn't, it isn't as true as, as literacy that everybody really does, really does mathematics. Um, in the way, in the with, well, with the fluency with which they do um, uh, read and write. Now, I was a maths teacher for a while, and so I can t- I, when I say this that that it, it's the fault of education. I mean, it's my fault as well. Um, so, but some things are. So sometimes things enter into the vernacular, and you don't really know they have. So when I was a kid, I used to play uh, top trumps, and one of the numbers that you could everyone knows how top trumps work right you choose a category or a trait or something and you compete on the numbers high and low etc one of the tr- one of the top trump stats was 0 to 60 and how many seconds it took now that idea is a it's a compound rate of change isn't it it's a second order differential like that is actually unthinkable sort of pre-calculus i think acceleration is actually in itself quite a complicated uh topic but people now that drive cars do understand it. So there is the, the, even though they don't think they're doing mathematics, there is a, a conversational fluency with what is quite a complicated idea, like a second-order differential. Don't, I mean, uh, people thought for a long time that heavier things f- fell faster and things, things like this, and, and gravitation kind of took a, the, the ideas took a while to arrive. Actually, I noticed when I when I searched for this image, and I don't know if this is the dumbing down of education, but that's that is no longer on the, uh, the <laughs> no longer on the the car the the only car image I could find. Um, so, as I was preparing this talk, I think I've got via osmosis um, 
something from this chap at IBM Watson, uh, the research lab. I think I think outside New York, and the article that well, it's it's more of a book. In fact, is about notation as a tool of thought. So I've long I've long. When I first studied um, calculus, I thought that there was a certain things are easy because of the way the notation's chosen. So, apologies for the for the uh, iffy image. You know, if you say dy by dx, that's the rate of change in y with respect to x. If you actually have it in terms of another variable, this 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 equation is is true. And people think it's obvious because oh the dt the uh, oh the dt's just cancel like a fraction. Um, actually, the, when Newton, well, you might know Newton and Leibniz kind of not co-discovered, as in working together, because I think Newton, Newton was a bit of a, uh, or, well, he wasn't a very nice person from what I can tell. Um, so, yeah, it looks obvious that DTs cancel like you would a fraction. In reality, Leibniz, absolute genius, chose this notation because these rules work. 1 over dy by dx is dx over dy, if you remember fractions. Uh, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, dy by, if I can get this is the right way around, off the cuff, dy by dt divided by dx by dt would be uh, dy by dx. So again, you, you divide by flipping and then multiplying. So the actual, the, the, the vision to see that uh, this thing had the same properties that people already know from fraction and choosing a good notation and letting the notation do some of the work um, is, was, a, was, a, was, a, was, I think, a, a stunning bit of uh, insight by, by Leibniz. Um, more recently, I've been studying um, quantum mechanics, so I never actually did, did it at, at university. Um, and I thought another similar very nice example was we've long had this notation on the left for an inner product, so A and B are vectors, the inner product, you might see sometimes we write A dot B, and that's basically a scalar quantity related to the uh, two vectors. Um, Dirac had a, an insight with this operator of separate, separating it out into a bra and a ket, and using the properties um, of those two operators, like how they distribute, etc., um, chose a great notation, that, so the notation actually helps. There may be better quantum physicists than I in the audience that perhaps want to uh, grab people at the end and, uh, and go through exactly why that's awesome. Um, so there I kind of liked it. Again, chosen a notation. You put those two things next to each other. You apply that operator on the left to the operator on the right. You get the inner product, which is, is just a scalar. But then you have also, like, as I say, sort of um, distributive laws and things like that within them. So if you have like a, a bunch of these things, you can group them together and because they're uh, well, rather associative, um, you can actually take them in pairs and, and sort of cancel them all down. Um, and again, so the notation's kind of working for you. Um, so yeah, the, the quote I wanted, and uh, I saw it in SICP, so the uh, Jerry Sussman, I think it might be a Jagstra quote where he says, we're so early in this, in the, in the age of, the, of computer science that we confuse the tool with the topic. So we think it's about computers and it's like calling biology microscope science. So there's a, a microscope scientist doing some work um, for I think, I, I, I think a, a, a animal health welfare charity. Um, so yeah, that, this idea that we've, we've confused the tool with the topic. So how did the, how did the, how did the, uh, how did the, the, t the tool, well, how did the topic come around? So, um, at the turn of the last century, so like 1900 or so, um, there was a program to formalize all of mathematics. Now, there's very good reasons why we should be happy that, that, that people didn't succeed. Um, because, um, well, without Gödel's theorem, mathematics would by now have been very boring. So nobody was thinking about computers as we have them. They were just thinking about ways of guaranteeing things were true by starting with axioms and then using only symbol manipulation, using only explicit rules uh, that are also, I was going to say machine checkable, that isn't quite what they said, that were checkable by some procedure. So this is from, this is from a, a textbook I used. Um, and the idea is you, you, your rules you're using are on the right um, and then you're in the world of only manipulating symbols. Now, the, the point of these, these formal systems is 
anything you show in the formal system, anything you derive, is actually true in the, in the real world. So a proof, which is just something you find in the formal system, corresponds to a truth. So the, and the, the hope was that we could get to all mathematical truths by choosing enough assumptions and the correct set of rules. Now, no set of rules is, 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 is adequate, which is great, because it means mathematicians will be in a job for a long time. Um, but the problem was, is they're talking about, so this is, at every step here, you've got multiple choices, there's loads of different rules you might use, and you have some goal, it's directed by a human at this point, so at this point you, uh, you, make, a, you make assumptions, but you've got a goal in mind, you use the rules, but you've still got an end in mind, and at some point you say, well, I'm done now, and then the, 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 the property of the formal system is every line of this proof can be checked by, you know, a dumb procedure, but this is still sort of requiring insights. So the next step is trying to express procedures unambiguously. So the two most common ones are the Turing machine and the Lambda calculus. Um, hopefully if this refreshes, I had some trouble uploading my, uh, I've spoiled the joke now. Um, <laughs> um, and I've lost my picture of the Lambda calculus. Um, so the, the Lambda calculus, um, from an initial starting point, it evolves deterministically. At every stage, there's only one thing you can do, there's only one thing you can do, there's only one thing you can do, and then it ends. So it's much more like a computer program. So we go from, I'm going to be very hand wavy on the lambda calculus, but I'm afraid. So here we say human sets up some assumptions, human uses the rules he knows about to get the result he wants, and then says, I'm done. The lambda calculus is, here is some expression that satisfies the rules. Every step, we say, apply the rule, apply the rule, apply the rule, apply the rule. I can't do anything anymore. That, that is now terminated. We're now done with that. We have the result of doing that computation. Turing machine is very, very similar. Move up and down the tape. Got some rules. Read and write from the cells. Move up and down. And at some point, you know that you're done. So... What time are we on? Sorry, I can't see a clock. 24, okay. Um, so, yeah, I was going to say, we've got more computing power in our pockets than uh, anybody realized. And I think everybody thinks, yeah, my iPhone's really powerful. But in reality, almost anything would be more powerful than, than they realized. Doing these things by hand is almost impossible. So, um, I wanted to talk now, so... That's kind of how computers arose. They arose out of mathematical logic. Then suddenly we, we put them in a dumb device that does loads of things really quickly. And then suddenly we arrive at like the, the computer revolution, if it can be called the, that. Um, so, but now we can use them to do other stuff. So given that they exist, and again, I, I meant to say before, we now, we always talk about uh, programming languages and stuff. So we always say we have like, you know, the, the Haskell meetup or the uh, whatever language you like meetup. But then I don't know if in ancient Egypt they had like the, the particular pen meetup, the kind of papyrus meetup, or whether, we, whether they were so invested, like who has the best papyrus? Oh, I, oh, you use the slightly yellow one. I use the more brownie red one, you know. Um, uh, <laughs> so I don't know whether that's the case but given that these things exist how can we use them and is it dumb to use them or is it smart so I, I was always with older uh, math mathematics teachers or that's less common in fact being unfair to them with older people who have who've studied uh, mathematics in, in the past uh, and who are arithmetically much more efficient than I am um, I think using a tool to sort of save you the effort is really good, and certain, certain other things become, become possible that weren't previously. So we can say to a kid now, for instance, what happens if you take a number and keep taking the square root? Where does it go? So you might say they choose nine, keep pressing the square root, where does it go? And the answer is, 
and this calculator does beha- to behave like the ones I had. You basically overflow and you can't tell the difference anymore and at some point it's just one. So there's some accuracy that it doesn't display and at some point the calculator declares bankruptcy and just, and just says it's one. That's a really interesting discussion. So what if you, what if you say to the kids, you start with a really big number and you keep pressing the square root, what happens? And it's actually quite, in- it's good for your intuition, this. I'm not doing any calculation. But I've got a great intuition that for one thing, taking the square root makes a number small really quickly. For another thing that this iterative process after however many iterations converges on one really quickly. That's an insight that like a 50 pence calculator can give me that would have been very hard for, for somebody before it to, to really get. And there's a great question now. I, I've just gone through, obviously not exhaustively, because the real numbers, are, there's quite a lot of them. But I've gone through like um, quite a few examples now, and I'm developing an intuition. So a good question might be, well, what would be a good number to try? You know, a kid's got some good intuition, maybe. We'll say, well, what about a number less than one? What happens there? So, um, is clear a button? Yeah, cool. Uh, so, what about a number less than one? So, 0.002, say. And does this have the same behavior? So, um, what does it mean? It's getting bigger. And then again, it converges on one from below. So, you've got basically. A, like a dynamic system that you start up here, it heads towards one. You start down there, it heads towards one. A great next question, or maybe the, maybe they said, you know, what happens with one? And he's like, great. Oh, so there you've got your that's your your fixed point anyway. And then if a kid if a kid's very smart, they might say, well, what about minus numbers? And then in, you're straight away into a very interesting discussion, aren't you? So you're straight away into a, a very interesting discussion, but you're not doing any calculation because the the dumb machine's done it for you really quickly. So that's kind of that's kind of what I really enjoyed about um, the fact that you can use computers not for, or not talk about computers. I'm not talking about the JavaScript that implements this. This is just a, a machine that uh, I'm using to illustrate some other points. So I thought that was rather nice. Yeah, so let me do that for you. All of um, A-level mathematics, certainly, and a good slice of, of uh, degree-level mathematics, in fact, can be solved by Mathematica now. So if you want to, if you really do want to solve problems, use the use the tool. Get that get those really the dumb machine churning really fast to do it for you. Um, oh, sorry, I've gone off full screen. Um, so yeah, leverage them wherever you can. Leave the insight that's necessary for you. So I one sort of final demo was again developing an intuition uh, in a way that is, is completely impossible, impossible, impossible before computers so if you ever did any pencil and uh, compass constructions they're actually really hard and especially especially if, if you're dyspraxic or whatever or you you have like attention problems because it actually takes ages it's actually fairly boring the process the revelation at the end isn't actually that good and you basically you, you basically take I don't know if you've done it if you might remember you take a shape a 2d shape and you can enlarge it transform it rotate it etc so one thing I absolutely adored was uh, some, some software called Geo... Well, I had, a, I had a non-free version. There's a free version called GeoGebra, which is great, which lets you set up... Can you see the origin here, the little green dot? And then the F is the thing I'm going to rotate. So if I fix the origin there and then rotate through some angle, what does it look like? So here I've got uh, a sort of dynamic view of what it's like. So at zero, if I rotate none and then I start going through it, that the extra intuition you get from knowing well roughly where's it going to be etc um, you can't really get with a, a compass construction or a ruler construction because it just takes ages um, similar for reflections actually getting a feel for what reflection is as, a, as an operation um, is actually quite hard and you, and you can kind of mechanically follow the steps you know go to the mirror go out the same angle etc but to get an idea intuitively of what it means, what happens if uh, the mirror becomes very close to the object, or I think I can move the object as well. Oh no, I can't in this one. Or the object becomes very close to the mirror, what happens there, and oh, does that really make sense? And like they can do things that perhaps you wouldn't, you wouldn't do otherwise. Um, uh, yeah, what, two more of these, because I like them. Oh no, that one's not working. Oh yeah, cool. So this one is this one is is brilliant. So enlargement via a scale factor. You might remember in the bottom left corner is the sort of center of enlargement. Here's my shape. 
So if I change the shape, the enlarged shape changes. That's really good. This, is, this would be a ruler line uh, in the normal case, or the pre-computer case. But here I'm just moving it around to, div- to sort of build up my intuition. So if I change that one, that one changes. If I change this one, obviously this one changes. And that's really good for developing an intuition for what actually enlargement does. And what does the scale factor do? So you're always... If I was to construct this with a ruler, I would basically take that point, draw lines through the points I'm interested in, and I would measure the distance to the first one, and I would say, oh, well, if I want to scale factor three, I'll go three times as far, and then the image that's drawn is three times as big. So sorry if you perhaps don't remember the the school mathematics, but um, now what if we change the enlargement factor? So really, really nice is scale factor two, it's twice as big. Scale factor three, it's it's three three times as big, but further away. You see how we're going along those rays. And really nice is, well, you can ask kids, well, what do you think scale factor one will be? And it's actually a really easy question asked like this. You say, well, what's scale factor one going to be? And they go, oh, it'll just be the same. That's a really hard, that's a really hard insight to arrive at, actually. Um, and you go, well, what about a fractional one? And it's an almost impossible question until you've seen this. But if I say now, what's, what, what's one going to be? What's fractional going to be? Um, actually, it's much easier to get. You know, a fraction of a half, it being closer to the or- closer to the centre of enlargement and half the size, actually, really good uh, intuition. And one one more is, which is the most difficult one, is uh, bisecting the line. So this was known by uh, Euclid. But you've got two points here, A, B. I've drawn a circle more than half of the distance between them, the same size from each. Where those circles intersect, I've drawn another line. That line is a perpendicular bisector of the line AB. So I'm sorry if you can't see that very well. Um, But the great thing, again, for developing that intuition is, well, what if A and B were further apart? Oh, well, it still works, doesn't it? What if if C was shorter, so my circumference of the circles was shorter? And again, straight away, you visualize the condition of, oh, it only works if I go at least half of the distance. But as long as I go the same distance on each side, uh, the bisector works. So that's really nice. You, you, rather than say to the kids, you've got a rule, you have to go at least halfway. Um, you draw them, and then you, it bisects the line. They can see why then. They know if it doesn't reach quite halfway, that the circles don't intersect at all. And then you can, I think that's, obviously move the circle in, make the line shorter. I think, that, I think that's really nice. Um, so... So that's basically using the output of programming or coding or whatever to get insights into something else. One other thing I've been interested in recently is um, using the actual method itself. So using programming, using the fact that we can unambiguously express procedural knowledge to learn other things. So Jerry Sussman uh, and Jack Wisdom, I've got a whole introduction to classical mechanics using the programming language scheme rather than uh, normal mathematics, which I thought was an interesting idea. There's uh, introductions to Bayesian statistics and statistics using Python, which I kind of liked. It's like, given that you know Python, let's learn statistics rather than, rather than perhaps the other way around. So I thought, again, that was interesting. It's like using the fact that you know programming to learn something else. Uh, so that was a little bit meandering, uh, so thank you for your indulgence. Um, so my only conclusion is, I guess, are we being esoteric or are we inviting people to these things that we've decided objectively as beings of pure rationality that are better um, than the other things? Are we inviting people in or are we kind of glad that we're in an elite group of people that know the secrets? Um, what happens when everybody does it? I think it's an interesting prob- uh, problem. Ooh. Uh, I think it's an interesting idea, an interesting premise. And if it gets to the point where it's like writing, where everybody just does it as a matter of course, oh, yeah, just program the car to do whatever, uh, I think that would be awesome. And the, the idea, we can use the output of this uh, great idea, this computation, to support other stuff. But we can also directly use the idea. So given that people already know computation, given that people already know a programming language, can we use it as a, a, as a medium of explaining it the same way I would use the fact I can read to learn about churches in Gothic France or something. Uh, So, yeah, thanks very much.